Welcome everyone to our Feed the Bears tour this wonderful 2020 homecoming weekend. We give this tour once a year and we are so excited that you could join us. My name is Danielle. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am a campus ambassador here at the university, one of the two who will be leading you through this tour today. I am originally from Windsor, California, so not that far away from Berkeley. I am a senior here, which is kind of crazy to say, and I am a sociology major. And uh, here on campus, I'm involved in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies. I am involved in the student group Bear Stage Productions, and outside of school, I'm actually a professional actor. Um, in addition to being a full-time student here at UC Berkeley. Awesome, and then I am your other ambassador for the day. My name is Casey. I use the pronouns he, him, his, originally from Long Beach, California, right next to Los Angeles. I am also a senior, so this is my last final hurrah here at Berkeley, my last year here, so making the best of it. Um, I am majoring in chemistry, and some of my involvement on campus, besides being an ambassador and a student, is I'm a part of the UC Rally Committee, which is a spirit group on campus. And there's actually a fun little ph philanthropy fundraising um, slide about that involves UC Rally Committee. So I'll be love, glad to talk about that. Um, we also, I'm also part of Cal Student Philanthropy, which is the whole point of this tour, which is also another just fun group I'm part of. And then I am sports, just getting out there and working out and being fit. Wonderful. And with that, we want to wish you a happy homecoming. We are so excited to welcome you virtually to UC Berkeley. Um, you can see that the motto for this year's homecoming is come together. And we hope that we can do that by conveying the spirit of Cal to you through this presentation and the other events that we'll be having this weekend. A little overview of the visit that we're going to have today. This tour primarily focuses on how philanthropic gifts to Berkeley have benefited our campus. It's not a campus tour per se, it is specifically going to be exploring um, Berkeley's philanthropic donations. This is going to be a one hour presentation and while we are giving it, you can type any questions that you have in that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This tour, this visit will also be recorded and it will be available on our website afterwards. If you want to view it again, check out what you might have missed. And if you want to check out more of Homecoming and Parents Weekend this year, you can go to our website at homecoming.berkeley.edu. Awesome. And so now with that, welcome back to UC Berkeley. Um, this may, it may have been a while since you have come to campus or it's this might be your first time seeing campus, but no matter what, this is probably your first time seeing campus in this capacity online. Um, so as you can see in the top left corner, that is the whole entire campus, a little brief overview of the entirety of campus from like a little um, drone shot. Um, on the bottom right, that's actually Sather Gate, which is one of the gifts from a benefactress, Mrs. Jane K. Sather. So she, because of her, we have that lovely gate. Actually, come to think of it, all the pictures that you see here are kind of come from some cap capacity from a benefactor or benefactress, um, uh, all from philanthropy. So the Sather Tower in the middle, also on the top right, along with um, a Doe Memorial Library, also had um, uh, some funding from the lovely um, benefactors. And then the bottom left has the inside of the Hearst Mine Building also coming up on these slides. And then one quick brief um, thing to talk about is the 150 years of women. So Berkeley was founded 153, 152, coming about 153rd. Um, so we founded 152 years ago and two years after we were founded, we started admitting women into the university, which is way beyond or way before so many other colleges, which is so great to hear about Berkeley being so progressive even back in the day. Um, and so in this um, uh, so visit, you will hear about all the philanthropy going on on campus, but also about some notable women and how they have given back to campus. And so, yeah, so briefly, so I already kind of talked a little bit about the agenda, but so just going over again, we'll start with a brief campus overview and then we'll lead into Cal Athletics and specifically about some families that have helped to donate to Berkeley, specifically the Haas family and the Hearst family. Then we'll move into the influential women that I mentioned with the 150W. Um, then we'll move on to research and all the research that is being done at Berkeley, especially thanks to some um, uh, all the funds that are being that Berkeley has. Um, and then into the Rouser College of Natural Resources. So philanthropy goes into a lot of our colleges, but Rouser is Rouser College of Natural Resources specifically. And then we can go on to the other um, uh, capacities of campus that are really used by undergrads are the libraries, the student, the Sproul Plaza area and student philanthropy. Those are all things that are heavily used by students and like no matter what college they are in um, and are very much greatly appreciated. So with that, we can move on to the first part. 
Wonderful, thank you, Casey. Um, so our campus was founded in 1868 and it is a state-sponsored land-grant university. And what that means is President Abraham Lincoln actually signed into law the Morrill Land Grant Act, which um, obviously granted land and also funds and resources allocated to new universities on the west coast of the United States created to rival the private universities on the east coast. And um, noting that this land did not belong to Berkeley originally. I want to take a second to read you a land acknowledgement. Uh, we take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. So with that statement in mind, as we continue to explore the campus, UC Berkeley is currently supported with 14% state funding. Um, state sponsorship and state funding has been uh, intrinsic to the university since its founding. The campus size today is about 31,000 undergraduates and about 12,000 graduate students. So it is a very large campus. In the pictures on the right side of your screen, you can see that beautiful sweeping view of the campus around the Campanile. You can also see one of the original buildings on campus. In the top left corner of the pictures there, that is South Hall. Um, and that was the first building uh, built on the Berkeley property in 1874. One important thing to notice is that we are currently in the middle of the Light the Way campaign. This is a $6 billion campaign that was launched in February 2020. It is one of the largest campaigns launched by any United States university, public or private. The top goals of this campaign are 100 new tenure track faculty positions, 300 new graduate student fellowships, a dramatic increase in undergraduate scholarships, and campus housing for all freshmen, sophomores, and first year transfer students. So that is a very exciting project, and if you want to learn more about it, you can go to light.berkeley.edu. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. And just a little shout out to the Light the Way campaign. If you look in the bottom right of my screen, this little um, virtual background comes from Light the Way campaign, and it's my favorite background. So shout outs to from the Light the Way campaign. So first, moving on, we'll go on to talk about a little bit about athletics. And one major thing to talk about athletics is our California Memorial Stadium, or Memorial Stadium for short, or even CMS. Um, so with Memorial Stadium, it was first opened in 1923 as a memorial to our World War I veterans. It was built by John Galen Howard. He'll, you'll see his name pop up periodically throughout this entire um, visit because he was a very influential architect throughout the, the early stages of Berkeley's you know, development. Um, so it was first opened in 1923, and it was actually built on top of the Hayward Fault Line, which wasn't exactly ideal, especially for California with all the earthquakes that we get. So then it was retrofitted in 2012, and in that retrofitting, what they did was they split the stadium into three pieces along the um, fault line, so if there ever was an earthquake, it would only shift around and not actually fall apart. Um, it's actually pretty cool they're able to accomplish that because originally when it was built, it, the entire stadium took up or used more than a thousand tons of lumber, concrete, rock, steel, sand, even to, um, to build the stadium. So the fact they were able to use all of that material again to retrofit it in 2012 is just pretty amazing. Um, they also added a new uh, um, uh, viewing section, not view, new viewing section, but they retrofitted a viewing section, section and they added a new press box. So that was uh, included in the retrofitting. And then one cool thing that was added, thanks to some benefactors, um, uh, Lisa and Doug Goldman, was the Simpson Center for Students Athlete High Performance, big name. Um, but it was made possible by Lisa and Doug Goldman. And what it is, it's, it's over a thousand square feet of area for student athletes to go work out as well as study. And so it can hold up to 450 student athletes at a time, which is just so great because you have so many Division I athletes and also I mean, yeah, so many Division One athletes that need, that are very academically minded, but also very sports minded. So the Simpson Center is a really great addition, thanks to them. And then one cool thing to talk about with athletics is the UC Rally Committee bonfire. So here's where I'm going to geek out a little bit about the UC Rally Committee. Um, so we, so leading up to our big game against Stanford, we call it Big Game Week, and we have the bonfire rally. I'm sure if any of you have gone, come to Cal, you may have heard of it or maybe even gone, even as alumni, might come back and see it. It's always a great thing. It's always so much fun. 
Um, but so for 100, over 120 years, it was mainly just wood. We just had a wood burning structure, but in light of all the of wildfires and also just to be environmentally and eco-friendly, um, the, the rally committee actually fundraised over $60,000 $60, for a new metal structure so we can continue having the bonfire for years to come. It actually holds a very close place in my heart because I was the treasurer of, that, of the UC rally committee the year that we had the um, a structure included. So it was so much fun to help work on the fundraising campaign for that. And now I can kind of say that I helped to give back to Berkeley in that way by just working the hours for it. Um, so it was just really cool to have. And then, so in the pictures, you can see the right is this Memorial Stadium. The, in the bottom left, it's actually the stadium right after it was completed in 2012. And so that's like a kind of sweeping view of the entire inside of the stadium. And then the top left, you can see that is the Greek theater with the actual metal bonfire structure that we call um, the, the Phoenix structure, you know, rising from the ashes. Um, and then last one other from a nice thing that was added to through athletics uh, by some lovely benefactors and some uh, donators are was the Legends Aquatic Center. So Legends Aquatic Center cost over $18 million. And it was all privately funded by the Cal Aquatics Legends. And that is a nonprofit group that is headed by UC Berkeley alumni. And it, in the um, edition of the Aquatics Legends, Legends Aquatic Center, excuse me, um, it includes a 50 meter pool, a team room, a locker room, and a diving tower. And it's actually pretty cool that I'm um, seeing the diving tower. I live about uh, five minutes east of the aquatic center. So whenever I would walk to and from campus, I would walk past the center and I would always see people diving or not people, divers. They would always climb up to the top of the diving tower and do so many flips in the air and land, land in the water without a splash. It was just so incredible to see. And it's just so nice to that they have that facility for them to work out and train in because I can't imagine trying to do that, you know, in a five, in a five foot diving pole. No, they need a tower for that. So with that, as a little kind of brief overview of um, all the lovely funds that have gone, gone to athletics. Wonderful. And now we'll talk a little bit about some of the families who have contributed so much to UC Berkeley over the years, the first being the Haas family. So the Haas School of Business you might be familiar with, it opened in 1995. This facility was designed by Charles Moore and it cost $55 million and this was entirely funded through private donations, 23.75 million of which was donated by the Walter and Elise Haas Fund. There is also Haas Pavilion. You can see that in the top right of your screen. This was a $57.5 million project. 10 million of this came from Walter Haas Jr., who is the CEO and chairman of Levi Strauss and Co. and his wife, Evelyn. Um, this was uh, the Haas School of Business donation, actually, the 23.75 number by the Walter and Elise Haas Fund, uh, was actually the largest gift in the university's history at that time. And that is why the business school was renamed to honor that gift. Awesome. And so now, um, including, the, including the families that helped build Berkeley with the Haas family is the Hearst family. Hearst family is included in some of the, as one of the greatest benefactors to the university. They've been giving back to the university since our very early beginnings. And so it's just so wonderful that they were able to give so much to the campus. Um, the first building to talk about is the Hearst Memorial Mining Building. So it originally started out as a mining building. It was donated by Phoebe Hearst, or the money was donated by Phoebe Hearst um, in honor of her husband. Um, and so John, I think his name is John Randolph first for some reason. Yeah, William, sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong name. William Randolph first. Um, so it was, honored, um, it was donated um, by Phoebe Hearst um, to the university in honor of her husband, William Randolph first. Um, oh, memory of George Hearst. Oh my God, I'm missing up my Hearsts. I am so, so sorry. Um, so a memory of George Hearst. Um, and this building, the Hearst Memorial Mining Building, was designed by John Galen Howard. So again, John Galen Howard is making another entrance here. And it's a very gorgeous building. It's the build the left picture. That is the inside of the Hearst Memorial Mining Building. It is very gorgeous. I actually had an inorganic chemistry class. It actually bring, um, brings um, to mind that the mining building was originally a part of the mining school here at Berkeley. But as mining was the forefront back in the late 1800s, it is no longer the forefront. So mining then thus changed from a mining college to more of an engineering minded college. And now our college of engineering is so great along with chemistry. Chemistry also works well in that building. And so I go into that building many times for my inorganic chemistry class. And it's just a very gorgeous building on the inside. And every day when I go in, I go, wow, thank you, Hearst. Um, so that's, that is the um, Hearst Memorial Mining Building. Also it's on the top right picture. Then we have Hearst Greek Theater. It was a gift of William, that's the one of William Randolph Hearst, excuse me. Again, the Hearsters are so amazing. Um, so the William Randolph Hearst was the one 
that gifted the Hearst Greek Theater. And it was actually first used by President, Ro President Roosevelt when he delivered the commencement address. Um, and then later on is now used by as a concert venue for a lot of um, artists that want to come and perform here, as well as the UC Rally Committee's bonfire um, and a plethora of other performance events that happen in the Greek theater. Um, so lovely. And then one other thing to mention with the Hearst family is the Hearst um, Women's Gym. So with the Hearst Gym is a very nice athletic facility for women back in the day. And now it's open to everyone to go and work out specifically for their pool. And the pool actually had contains so much water that the city of Berkeley had to build a whole new hydro, um, uh, um, not cleansing, but a whole new water plant in order to uh, filter enough water for the pool here at Berkeley. So it's a very nice that we have a nice pool and a theater and a mining building, all thanks to the Hearst family. Wonderful. And you can see a little bit about of that um, gymnasium for women in the top right uh, of the images on this slide. Um, you cannot see the entire thing, but it was actually uh, designed by two of California's leading architects, Julia Morgan and Bernard Maybeck. So Phoebe Hearst, for whom it was named, sponsored an architectural contest that actually resulted in the historic central part of our campus, and she was the first female regent. Her total contributions to this campus actually are valued at around $15 million. Mrs. Hurst was actually a feminist in the suffragette movement. She fought for the advancement of women and her many contributions include a scholarship program that continues today for female students at UC Berkeley. She funded many libraries. She helped to establish the National Congress of Mothers and she co-founded the All Girls National Cathedral School in Washington, DC. And as I said, she would become the first female regent of the University of California. Um, she is also responsible for the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology. She had a passion for travel and discovery and around 1890 she began supporting anthropology. She would fund scholarly expeditions all around the world. Um, you can see an image from that in the bottom right corner where she is in Egypt. Um, she actually created a well-documented collection of around 60,000 objects and her vision was for her Museum of Anthropology to be a great educator. Uh, it was dedicated to the dissemination of knowledge among the many, giving the people of California every educational advantage, which I think is an incredibly beautiful um, statement to define the mission of a museum on our campus. In 1901, this collection was actually donated to the University of California, and it still cares for the collections that she amassed today. And another influential woman on our campus was Jane K. Sather. Um, she is responsible for the Campanile, which you saw earlier in the tour. Um, she donated $100,000 in 1901 for the endowment of two chairs on campus in classical literature and also in history. She's also responsible for the Jane K. Sather Law and Library Fund. In 1991, it was announced that her funds would also support the endowment of a third chair, which would be established as the Peter Sather Chair in History. Speaking of Peter Sather, she chose in 1911 to memorialize her husband with a physical presence on campus. And she endowed a gift of $40,000, which today is about $1,051,636 to create uh, an entrance to our university. You may, of course, be familiar with Seether Gate, the beautiful and now green gate that is sort of the entrance to the south side of our campus. Um, this gate was named Sather Gate. It was completed in 1913, and it was made of concrete, granite, and bronze. It was named, of course, for Peter Sather, and it was designed by our campus architect, John Galen Howard. On the right side of the screen, you can see our 150W mosaic. So as Casey mentioned earlier in the visit, we are celebrating 150 years of women here at Berkeley. We are so grateful for the contributions of incredible intelligent women over the years. Um, I actually am a part of this mosaic. Um, you can kind of see me in it in like the top right corner. Um, so this was really fun to create. And this year has been full of celebration of incredible women who have accomplished incredible things. And one of them very recently was a professor here on campus, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, who you may know won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her innovative work on gene editing. So we are so excited about that um, as an incredible addition to a year of celebrating women. And for more information, you can visit 1dw.berkeley.edu. And one brief thing about Jen Jennifer Doudna is the fact that she won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And being a chemistry major, I never really thought that I would want to win a Nobel Prize just because I didn't think I had anything to give to the world. I mean, not yet. But um, the second that I heard that she won the Nobel Prize, it really just like fueled the fire in me to want to win a Nobel Prize. I mean, it was never a goal of mine, but because of Jennifer Doudna, it really just like, you know, 
now I want to win one. So just a fun thing about Jennifer Doudna. Also with that 150W, if you see the little triangle created by the five and the W, if you mirror it onto the left side, it, that's where I am and in that little spot in right there. So also part of it. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, the best known landmark on the Berkeley campus is the Sather Tower, or better known as the Campanile. It was a gift to Mrs. Jane K. Sather, an early benefactor to the university. The tower rises majestically to a height of 307 feet and is surmounted by a carillon of 61 bells. The first 12 bells were installed when the tower was completed in 1917. 36 were added in 1979, a gift to the class of 1928. The final 13 were given in 1983 by Jerry and Evelyn Chambers, devoted alumni of the university. The bells are played three times a day. Their music is a much loved tradition. We welcome you to university and hope you enjoy the inspiring view from the tower. Sorry, I had to throw that in because if any of you have um, visited Berkeley and have gone up the Campanile, you have probably heard that chime at least once or twice going up the, el up the elevator. Um, it tells you a lovely um, a array of what happens <laughs> about the tower as you're going up. And being a campus ambassador, I have worked the elevator for many hours, so it's been engraved in my mind. So I just want to make sure that you all um, can understand it. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yes, yeah, so now I can move on to actually talking about the Campanile. So the Campanile, um, uh, just like Daniela talked about, um, it was gifted by Jane K. Sather. She donated over a million dollars in today's value for the Campanile. Um, uh, and uh, we, the reason we call it the Campanile is, be is because it was modeled after the St. Mark's Campanile in Italy. And so if you look at Campanile, I think we're starting to become more famous than the St. Mark's Campanile. So it's kind of nice that we have that going for us is um, our Campanile, or the Campanile, is also the third largest bell and clock tower in the world. So when the same Jane K. Sather donated the money, she really wanted to make sure that it, for her husband that it was a um, very noticeable tower. So she made it very large for him. Um, <laughs> um, the first set of bells, when they were installed in 1917, when the tower was completed, it cost over, just over ten and a half thousand dollars And on them it is inscribed, Gift of Jane K. Sather, 1914. So when they were first, they were, in, they were a gift in 1914 and then they were installed and they were played in 1917 when the Campanile was completed. And like I mentioned in my little spiel when I was talking about the um, Campanile is, is don't, the next 36 bells were donated by the class of 1928. And then finally, Jerry and Evelyn Chambers donated the last set of bells, um, the last 13 bells, bringing the grand total of bells to 61 total. I don't know entirely how they fit the bells up there, but if you could, you could always potentially donate more and make it 62 or 63 bells. I don't know where they would fit, but there's a fun little note to that. Also, one final um, uh, note about the Campanile is it is so high up, again, 307 feet at the very tippy top, but around where the cone meets the tower, we actually have peregrine falcons nesting up there. And so you can go on to, I think, I believe it's calfalcons.berkeley.edu, and you can see a live feed video of them when they are nesting. Currently, they are not nesting because it's not nesting season, but in the, I believe in the winter to the early spring, that's when they, the peregrine falcons start to mate and start to um, uh, begin nesting up there. And then they go, then go into their nesting box and falcons are born. And for the past three years, so ever since I've been here at Berkeley, there have been chicks in the nest and there's always been a naming contest for naming the chicks. Um, I remember the very first year they came out with the names Berkeleyum, Californium, and Laurentium, which are all elements that were discovered by Berkeley professors and chemists. So that's a cool thing. And then they moved on to uh, it's uh, Carson and Cade, which were some, um, uh, some, some people to do with um, uh, Peregrine Falcon Studies. So it's just a very cool thing that with the Campanile is a wonderful gift and it, it's even um, uh, providing homes to Peregrine Falcons who were endangered species and now are kind of thriving. Oh my gosh, I love our baby falcons every year. Thank you for adding that. So now we'll talk a little bit about research on campus, specifically some of the buildings that have been donated um, to advance our research goals. You might know that Berkeley is a research one university, which means that all of our faculty are actively innovating in their fields, not just winning Nobel prizes, but actively publishing research, publishing books, um, creating innovation for the students in the very field that they are teaching. So it's very exciting to be on Berkeley's campus in the midst of all this research. And to contribute to that, we have um, a couple buildings I'll talk about now. So you can see Stanley Hall. Stanley Hall is on the left side of these images. Um, Stanley Hall was originally built in 1952. Construction was done in 2007 with a budget of $162.3 million. This was funded with a combination of state and private funds. 
There are 40 research labs in this building built to encourage collaboration among the adjacent departments, including chemistry, biology, engineering, and physics. Stanley Hall has a 300 seat auditorium, a 120 seat auditorium, and a smaller 45 seat auditorium. So it is an incredibly useful building for our STEM oriented students. This building is named for Wendell M. Stanley. He won the 1946 Nobel Prize in chemistry. He was biochemistry chair at Berkeley, uh, as well as virology chair. He was also founder and director of our virus lab. Stanley Hall today is Berkeley's headquarters for the California Institute for Quantitative Biosciences. And this office and lab complex supports interdisciplinary teaching and research as part of our campus's health sciences initiative. The other building we'll talk about here is Campbell Hall. So Campbell Hall was completed in January of 2015. It was begun in May 2012. Campbell Hall um, is home to our physics department, astronomy, astrophysics, experimental physics. This was an $80 million facility. It had both public and private funding with major funding by the Heising Simons Foundation, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and of course, the state of California. This building is incredibly special because on the rooftop of the building, there is actually a 10 meter reflecting telescope. And students every fall get to use this telescope if they are taking one of my favorite classes on campus, Astronomy C10. So Astro C10 is also known as Introduction to Astronomy. It is a great general breadth requirement course for students. And as part of the labs required for that class, you actually can go up to the roof of the building and look through the telescope. You get credit for it, you write a little summary about what you learned, and it helps contribute um, to your overall experience in the class. And I personally was able to look through the telescope and I saw the Andromeda galaxy, I saw Saturn, and I saw the Hercules globular cluster. I still remember those and I still remember what they looked like clear as day. I was obsessed with that class. I thought it was so much fun and I will never forget that I got to actually look through and see those things in real time because of this building. So I'm so grateful for that experience and um, for the donations that made that building possible. I also took the class um, Astro C10 and I got to go out to see, to look through the um, telescope and it was just an amazing, an amazing sight. It's just so much out there in the world. Um, so moving on, moving past um, astrology, moving into the Rouser College of Natural Resources. Originally, it started out as just the College of Agriculture with the Morrill Land Grant Act that gave California land for universities, as Danielle mentioned. Um, at the very beginning of the tour, so hope you're paying attention. Um, so with that act, the university established the College of Agriculture. And so with the College of Ag Agriculture, it was mainly focused around agriculture, but then um, UC Berkeley opened up a, a separate facility called the University Farm near Sacramento. That University Farm a, soon became the U University of California Davis. So once that University of California Davis became, um, it came into fruition, uh, then the College of Agriculture then changed to about the College of for, or then combined with the College of Forestry and eventually became the College of Natural Resources. And then later on, when with the former Dean of the College of Natural Resources, Gordon Rouser, he, for the Light the Way campaign actually, he donated $50 million, which is the largest amount ever received by the college. So after donating that $50 million to the college, he then, <laughs> we then graciously named, renamed the college to the Rouser College of Natural Resources. And a cool thing about the um, gift that he gave is that nearly all of it is unrestricted funds. So it's just going to support anything that the college needs across anything, across any platform for the college, um, which is actually pretty great because actually one of my um, near and dear friends, he is in the College of Natural Resources. And he just, he really appreciates everything with that college. It's actually one of the smaller colleges, you know, Letters of Science is about 70% of campus. So with, within the College of Natural Resources, it's very easy, or at least easier, to see advisors, and it's a very close-knit community, and he appreciates every single day within the College of Natural Resources. And so with this um, money, and with this gift that um, uh, Rouser was able to give to the college, he just, it'd be able to just benefit um, everything that, um, everything that makes this the co small college so great, plus being within the whole big campus community of UC Berkeley. It's just so nice to have um, with the Rouser College of Natural Resources. And then another um, a cool thing or nice fun thing with the um, gift aid is that enrollment within the College of Natural Resources is increasing every single year. And so this will help to go to establish more um, research positions or possibly some research positions. Again, it's all open up to whatever the college might need. So it might be for research, it might be for some um, graduate students from, uh, not programs, but positions for graduate students. Um, and it's on everything that it could possibly be made to make this college better, Rouser was able to give with this $50 million donation. 
Wonderful. And now we will talk about the libraries on campus and the surrounding area. So you can see in this picture Memorial Glade, which is a beautiful, expansive, grassy lawn on campus. All kinds of events happen here for students. We have had movie showings before the movies were even in theaters. We have had concerts. And of course, every Cal Day, a ton of amazing events happen here. And Cal Day is, of course, our large campus celebration that happens every spring. Memorial Glade was built in 1997 from donations by the war classes, these being the classes of 1945, 46, and 47. Those donations totaled a million dollars. And today, Memorial Glade bears the seal of the University of California in a few separate locations around the Glade. Originally, um, those seals and the Glade are intended to uh, memorialize and honor the classes uh, that served and the students, staff, and other faculty who participated in World War II. Um, however, over the years, these seals have also become home to a slightly different tradition. In addition to not stepping on them in order to honor um, the war classes and to honor the Cal staff who served in World War II, they also bear with them a kind of a curse if you step on them. If you come to campus during rush hour, you will actually see students who are walking towards the seal part and come back together on the other side. Because legend tells that if you step on the Memorial Glade seal, you will be cursed with bad grades, bad luck, you will fail your finals, you will never get a 4.0 GPA, all kinds of academic travesties will fall upon you. Um, and that probably shows how much Berkeley students care about their academics and getting the best grades possible um, that we would go so far as to have um, a tradition revolving around that. But that is a little bit about Memorial Glade. Um, in the foreground of this image right there in the bottom left, you can see part of Doe Library. You'll see more of it on the next slide. But Doe Library was built in 1910. It was funded partially by um, businessman Charles Franklin Doe's estate, uh, about $779,000 of his estate. He left a quarter of his property to the Regents for the library, which is where it stands today. All right, and on this slide on the top right, you can actually see um, the front of Doe Library. So it was designed in this beautiful Greek Parthenon style. And the reason is because the designer, our campus architect, John Galen Howard, specifically wanted to create a sort of Athens of the West, that being a pinnacle of knowledge to be aspired to here in Berkeley. Um, so Doe Library is one of the most beautiful libraries on campus, in my opinion, and I love spending time there. But another really beautiful library is the CB Star East Asian Library. And this library was built in 2008 at a cost of $42 million, funded entirely on private donations. And it was the very first library here on the West Coast devoted to East Asian studies. It has an immense collection, and it is incredibly beautiful for anyone studying anything to sit and study in, but also if you want to explore East Asian languages and the texts, they have a phenomenal collection. There is also Moffat Undergraduate Library, which is home to the Free Speech Movement Cafe, which of course, its name is an homage to the Free Speech Movement, which occurred here on campus. An FSM Cafe was built with the support of an alumni of the university named Stephen M. Silberstein. Um, Recent updates actually happened to the fourth and fifth floors of Moffitt. In 2016, specifically, the same firm that did the Facebook headquarters and also revamped the SFO airport um, built and designed new floors that were designed for collaborative learning. So students there are welcome to talk and eat and work together and get out whiteboards and work on their projects. However, the really cool thing about Moffitt is that alternating floors have different purposes. So if you are a student who likes to study in the quiet, you can actually go to a floor that is specifically no talking. Um, you have to be reading, you have to be working, you cannot chat with your friends, you can't, you know, bring a snack. So Moffitt is a great library for any kind of student and it is extremely convenient for us to have here on campus. In total, we have 24 official libraries here on campus. We also have an offsite facility in Richmond and online resources through our OSCICAT program and JSTOR. Um, our libraries have over 13 million volumes, so we have a massive collection. Uh, if you are not finding the book you need, you just aren't looking hard enough here. Um, and you also, if, as a Cal student, I have used the library for personal interests too, besides research, besides class, um, because we have so many books. I am a huge J.R.R. Tolkien fan, and he has some books that were not 
printed more than once, only a few of them exist. And I actually found out that UC Berkeley's collections have one of these books that I've been wanting to read for years and I've never been able to find. Um, even in an online version, it didn't exist. So I found one, I got it through UC Berkeley and I was able to read it. And if I had had to find that on my own, it would have cost me several hundred dollars to acquire that book. So I am so grateful for that. That was such an exciting day for me. Um, our campus libraries are so convenient to us and I am grateful for them. Yes, libraries are amazing. And in this um, uh, little segment with music, there's also a music library. So I'll talk about more with libraries and also my own little library tidbit. Um, so, so starting off with music though, first we have the Morrison Hall. Morrison Hall was donated in 1968 by Mary T. Morrison. She was actually one of the first women to graduate from Berkeley. So thank you 150W. Um, and so she donated $2.5 million along with some books um, in name of her husband, who is also a fellow Cal alum. And so a cool thing with the Morrison Hall is that, sorry, it claim it, no, oh, excuse me. And it, there's a special lecture hall in there that can seat about a hundred people for lectures, recitals, and rehearsals. And there are also practice rooms within Morrison Hall. So if you are a student who lives on campus or if you're a student who lives off campus and you need a place to practice your instruments, you can always go to Morrison Hall and have a little um, a space for you to practice your instrument without bothering anybody and making beautiful music for those that are walking by. Um, then there's also, it also contains a, a special space that is reserved for the instrumental collection of Baroque music ensemble. And there's also plenty of other office spaces within Morrison Hall for professors and for faculty to work within, inside, within, within the hall. Um, and then we have the Jean Gray Hargrove Music Library. I'll probably refer to it as Music Library because I always mess up the word Jean as Jane. Um, but so it was donated in 2004 and with the donation about of $10 million, about four of which came from Jean Gray Hargrove, who is a graduate of the music program. So with that donation, they added the music library. And within the music library, there's over 200,000 volumes of music within the, the library, but whether it's about books about music or you know actual um, music sheets. And there's also plenty of music and video recordings. Uh, I think it's over 100,000 of the recordings of music and video. So you can go in there and find whatever song or whatever type of um, music you're looking for. You can, you can actually like, find the, note, the sheet music for it as well as a recording of it most likely. So that's always a very nice thing to add. And oh, my one cool fun fact about the Jean Grey Hargrove Music Library is that I was actually taking this one class about fungus and about the, his, the effects of fungus throughout the world, just the history of it. And my, I had to do a project for that class and I chose the effects of fungus and mushrooms on music. And so I went into the music library thinking, you know what, if I had to find any book about, you know, psychedelic effects in music, it'd probably be the music library. And there's actually a book solely dedicated to the effects of um, psychedelic, like, you know, drugs and others to on, on the music industry, especially like leading up with the Beatles. So there's a very cool music um, uh, library, a very cool like, place to go find the book. I didn't really think I would find. So the music library is just so very great. Um, in the top, uh, not the top left, but just the left side of the picture, that is where is, that's where Morrison Hall is located within, within the little music department. And the top right is the music library, the Jean, Jean Grey Hargrove Music Library. And another fun fact about the music library, actually looking at it, is that the entire city of Berkeley is a little bit skewed from the um, Oakland um, uh, from the Oakland city like streets. So the Berkeley streets are just a little bit skewed a bit. I think it's a bit more to the, to the east, the streets are skewed, but the library is built in line with the Oakland um, uh, streets. So it's actually built in line with it. So it's perpendicular or parallel to Oakland versus being skewed at Berkeley. It's a fun little thing to look up with the, um, the constructional the, um, maps of the Bay Area. That's, I remember seeing, reading about that. And then also leading in with more music, there's plenty of music always going on throughout the campus. It's always so lovely. Um, uh, being on rally committee, I am not a part of Cal Band, but I have definitely seen them perform at countless times. And I know even if, even if you, I, I'm a, everyone watching, if they have not um, been on campus, at least probably heard of Cal Band, or at least know how amazing they are. They are our California marching band, and they play so many great California songs, as well as other songs by other um, artists and make little covers. Um, I actually love their one and that show that they put on about Mamma Mia. So Cal Band is always very great and very wonderful. And my very first experience with Cal Band was actually right in front of the um, music library on Cal Day, I think, I believe it was 20, 2015, no, 2017, excuse me, with my, with my math, <laughs> when, I was, when I showed up. But I believe it was 2017 when I first saw the Cal Band perform. It was right in front of the music department. And that's what made me just fall in love with the university was Cal Band. And there's, there's also countless other 
performance groups that are on campus along with Cal bands. There are acapella groups. There are, um, I, my one friend is actually in a piano class and is hoping to join a piano club. So those who are solely dedicated to piano and even organs and keyboards, everything with keys. Um, and then there's, so there's acapella, there's the piano club, there's also um, just choirs and um, concert bands, not marching bands, but concert bands available on campus. And a lot of those um, groups do use Morrison Hall, especially the practice rooms, in order to go and practice their instruments on their own time. And so with all of this, it's very nice to have this lovely music aspect to Berkeley, since I would never really expect to see, to hear that much beautiful music coming from campus. I mean, being a STEM major myself, I would just assume there's research, but no, there's also the music, and it's just very beautiful to walk through campus, especially sit right next to the Campanile and hear the music being played from the music rooms. So that's it's always very lovely to hear every to hear whatever sounds coming from the music department as you're walking by continuing with that musical theme thank you casey um we will talk a little bit about zellerbach hall and you can see zellerbach hall here in the top left of this slide zellerbach hall is a very large performing arts facility it is home to cal performances and touring productions concerts happen here all kinds of ballet performances it is home to a lot of incredible performing arts uh companies and resource and um organizations that visit our campus this building was built with seven million dollars in donations. One million of this came from the family of Isidore Zellerbach. And the really cool thing about Zellerbach Hall is that it is not just home to one large hall or theater. It does have the theater that seats about 2,600 people. It is incredibly modern and beautiful and an incredible performing arts venue. But it's also home to some of the other performing artists on campus. So behind that and deeper into this gigantic building, there are all kinds of ballet studios, acting classrooms, um, small rehearsal spaces. There are also other dance facilities and a big um, costume storage facility and a costume, a costume crafting and creating room. There are also uh, facilities dedicated to scenery and set design and lighting and just all of the things that go together to create theater and to create performing arts. Zellerbach Hall is a bit of a maze and it is easy to get lost in there actually if you don't know where you're going to all of those different facilities, but I love Zellerbach Hall. I've spent many, many hours in that building myself because acting classes are being held there um, and have always been. And I especially love the costume shop. I love exploring and getting lost in that building. And it's probably what I miss most about not being on campus this year. So we also have the MLK Student Union. Um, the MLK Student Union was completed with gifts of um, some of our regents, Edwin Polly and Edward Heller. On the roof of this building are solar panels, and you may know that Berkeley is committed to being zero waste, committed to being um, an environmentally friendly campus, and we are actively moving towards our entire campus being environmentally friendly and being um, conservation minded as often as we can. So these solar panels on the roof were paid half by the students and half by the state. Um, the state wanted to match whatever the students put into the project. And interestingly, this project breaks even in 2020. So now we have begun to save money on energy by powering this building that way, which is um, incredibly exciting uh, and towards the goal of a zero waste environmentally conscious campus. Yes, with the zero waste, it is very great having the solar panels. And yeah, I'm very excited to start paying the dividends with these solar panels. It's just very cool to go very green and out with the fossil fuels, especially in this day and age, especially with all the, everything going on in California, less things that can that burn, the better, um, better using the solar. solar. Um, and so now moving on to the, some two other things that are involved with student philanthropy and also just are very much involved in student life along with MLK is the Cal Fund. And so the Cal Fund actually supports a lot of what undergrads do, again, with only 14% of funding coming from the state, uh, a lot of the Cal, the Cal Fund goes into filling a lot of the gaps. So the Cal Fund supports undergraduate education, scholarly research, and other academic ventures. Um, one thing to note, or a few things to note with the Cal Fund is that they help with the libraries. So keeping the libraries open 24 seven, especially during finals week, that comes out of the Cal Fund, like um, providing secretaries and like um, uh, student positions that can let students in and out of the library. Um, the Cal Fund helps pay for that. So that was a very nice thing. Um, then we also have CSOs. CSOs are community service officers. Um, and these are students that work through UCPD to walk to just keep campus safe. And they also provide a service called a bear walk. 
Bear Walk is, um, they walk students to and from wherever they need to go at night. So especially if they need someone to be to like be their walking buddy, um, a, yeah, built in like walking buddy, um, whenever they need to go somewhere at night, whether it's from a library to a dorm or from dorm to dorm to go visit friends. Um, CSOs are paid through Cal Fund, so it's a very nice option. It's a very nice um, a thing that is given back uh, via the Cal Fund. Um, also, it provides um, a, the Student Learning Center, Cal Fund pays for the Student Learning Center, and for the tutors there at the SLC. And the SLC, Student Learning Center, uh, that is a center for just tutors to hang out and they go and spend time helping other students in classes they might have taken or in subjects they might be uh, having difficulty understanding. So whenever I would go to the SLC, what it is, is basically to just to more describe it, it's like a giant um, cafeteria. And inside the giant cafeteria, just a giant big space, there are different tables with different subjects over them. So you go find, if you're having trouble with intro, introductory chemistry, you'd go to the introductory chemistry table or just to the science table and say, hey, someone can someone here help me with introductory chemistry? And as a tutor will come over and go, yes, I can definitely help you. And it's a very, very great place, the SLC. Um, and I actually uh, was thinking about working there one semester, but then sadly I didn't, but it's, I, it still haunts me that I wish I could have done it because it's just a, such, a, such a cool place, the SLC. And finally, one other cool thing to do with the Cal Fund are discovery classes. So discovery classes are offered through the College of Letters and Sciences. And with discovery classes, what they are is it helps students kind of discover what type, what type of um, field they want to go into with their major. So if you're a little bit undecided or undeclared, you can go, you can take a discovery class and just kind of fills in, it's more of than just a class, it kind of is like a whole experience to it. Um, so just speaking of Astro C10, which Danielle and I have both taken and have, we mentioned in the tour, um, with Astro C10, you can go and there's actually some seminars that are attached to the lecture if you're taking the discovery course. So you can go and see some uh, people talk within the field and you can see maybe I do want to go into this field, maybe I don't. There are even some um, uh, learning communities, I believe is the, is the term for it, within the dorms. So everyone on one floor would be taking a, a certain discovery course so they can kind of get to know each other through the discovery course and also get to know the field through the discovery course. It's just a very cool thing to have with the discovery course and all the different aspects of the course besides just the lecture, like the speakers and um, it's just done other events that go on with the discovery course that's all made possible through the Cal Fund, which is just so great and amazing. And one final thing with student philanthropy is the senior class gift. And actually kind of has changed since how senior class gifts used to be run. But the senior class gift, it is an example of how Berkeley students continually give back to the Cal community. With the senior class gift, originally what it was is students would donate their money and they'd get a plaque or a bench or something dedicated solely to their class. Also, they give back money to the university, but they get something, dedi and something dedicated back to them in their honor. Um, but with the senior class gift now, it also encompasses anything that any senior has, has gives back to the campus during their senior year. And so whenever any students would donate to the campus their senior year, they could donate specifically to their club, they could donate specifically to their college, or they can donate just to the university in general. All that money counts towards a senior class gift, and that just shows how much students actually really care for their university, making sure that um, undergrads in the, in the next following years after them, they're experiencing just the same amount of help and resources that, they had, that the, those current students have experienced. So it's very great and very lovely with the Cal Fund and the senior class gifts giving back to campus from both um, uh, from both benefactors and from other fund, from other donors and also from um, uh, students themselves trying to make sure that campus is the best that it can possibly be. All right, and looking forward, some of the recently completed projects on our campus have been extremely exciting. One of those was Berkeley Way West in 2018. So this building is home to the School of Education and the Department of Psychology, which was formerly in the now demolished Tolman Hall. This new building also houses our School of Public Health, which was previously in University Hall. Um, there is 230,000 square feet um, within this building for classrooms, offices, workstations, and collaborative space. Berkeley Way West actually houses 900 people on a daily average, which is incredibly exciting. It is a huge facility for our Berkeley staff and students. There's also Blackwell Hall that was completed in 2018 as well. Blackwell Hall is right next to campus and it is our newest residence facility. It is super up to date and it is in very high demand among our incoming students every year. And it was named for David Blackwell, our first black professor to receive tenure here at UC Berkeley. There's also Chu Hall finished in 2017 at a cost of $60 million completely funded by the campus's alumni and friends. Uh, Kevin Chu graduated Cal in 2002 and Dr. Connie Chen together made the naming gift, which was the largest gift to campus at that time from alums who were both under the age of 40. 
The Corette Visitor Center was also finished in 2016, and this is located within Memorial Stadium. Uh, the Corette Visitor Center was made possible by a generous gift from the Corette Foundation, and it is accessible from Lisa and Doug Goldman Plaza in front of Memorial Stadium. Berkeley's normally sees 175,000 visitors a year, um, but we did not have a permanent place to welcome them, to greet our visitors. So visitors would meet for their tours in other locations around campus. However, now we do have this dedicated facility and all of us campus ambassadors hang out there and lead tours from there and meet visitors there. It is a very special facility to us when we are on campus. It is very high tech. It has interactive screens and a beautiful Fiat Lux light display on the ceiling. It is an awesome place to start a tour during a normal um, tour season here at Berkeley. We also have some really exciting upcoming projects going on. One that you might have heard of is uh, the Berkeley Data Hub. Um, this is actually replacing the demolished Tolman Hall. The uh, Berkeley Data Hub is was born in part because of the popularity of computer science and data science on this campus. You may know that one of our most in-demand majors is computer science. Um, Berkeley is going to have a division of computing, of computing, data science, and society. And it will have a brick and mortar home called the Data Hub very soon. This has been made possible by, by an anonymous donation of $252 million. Each year, approximately 6,000 undergraduates actually take a data science course at Berkeley. And the new data science major has actually become the fastest growing major on campus. It approaches the size of the computer science major itself. So this project is super exciting and it will support a lot of students and this expanding community at Berkeley. We also are looking forward to the Baker Bioingenuity Hub. Um, this actually is replacing the old University Art Museum. Um, this project will be a full service life science incubator known as the Baker Bioingenuity Hub. This is a donor developed project and it will have private labs for enterprises, wet and dry open lab benches for both faculty and student researchers. And it will have a glass enclosed addition with 6,600 square feet of office space to support research functions here on campus. Finally, we are doing seismic safety adjustments to Giannini Hall, as well as renovations to our oldest building on campus that I mentioned, South Hall, which was uh, constructed in 1873. Awesome. And so then with that, there is no um, Q&A, oh, jumping out of it. Um, See, so, so there's no real um, question to answer. There's been answered by our um, lovely uh, campus ambassadors in the back end, but one question or one thing that would um, uh, we would love to talk about is um, uh, love leaving our mark or leaving a mark on campus. And one thing that um, about with leaving my mark on campus, um, specifically for me, like I was mentioning before with um, Jennifer Doudna winning the Nobel Prize in chemistry, it really lit a fire under me to try to leave my mark in some way. But especially with just chemistry, I always just enjoyed doing chemistry. I didn't know what mark I would want to make. So I didn't know. I didn't know what mark I want to make with chemistry, and so I, once Jen, once Jennifer Downa won the Nobel Prize for chemistry, it really just wanted me. It really kind of made me want to go out and really explore what chemistry can do for the world more than just in a research lab, but like actually going out there and finding all these new different ways to involve chemistry within every every single living, especially with like battery technology. That's one thing I was really interested in. Um, and so with that, as I'm kind of leading my mark, it's not specifically on the campus, but just with the campus like behind me and being a Cal alum, um, but specifically for campus, I would say going through with, at least with rally committee, um, with being spirited, but also academic, um, make, going to a college, making the college your own and being so spirited that you even come back for a homecoming, specifically like, like this tour for all those lovely alums listening, being so spirited that you love to come back for homecoming year after year after year. That's just the kind of mark I want to leave is, being so involved yet so uh, so educated is just the kind of mark that I want to leave. And Berkeley alum, alum, alums, excuse me, Berkeley alums have been doing that for countless years, being spirited and educated. And I just want to continue that tradition of being both educated and. Hmm. That's a wonderful goal. Um, yeah, thinking about you know the mark I want to leave on campus. It's such a storied campus, and I, you know as we've shown you in the last hour, there are so many incredible people who have made a huge difference to things on this campus, and especially students' lives on this campus. And I think when I think about my experience at Berkeley, what summarizes it for me is that I really was in awe of everything I've been able to accomplish here and everything I've been able to do all at once. And I hope that my legacy here at Berkeley has been demonstrating that 
you really can do it all here. You can do what you love and what you're passionate about. And the school, you know, has enough resources and has enough incredible opportunities that you can also explore academic interests. You can also achieve all kinds of things that you've wanted to pursue and um, discover in our sciences, in our social sciences, like what I study, and in other fields. Um, I am you know, very proud to have been able to both be a professional actor and also a student while I've been here. Um, and in my very last year here, I think that, um, yeah, I am just, I'm so grateful for UC Berkeley's um, opportunities and how generous the campus community and the university itself has been with um, time and resources for me to be able to accomplish everything that I could have dreamed of on this campus. Awesome. And so thank you for everyone who was stuck around with us for the entire hour about feeding the bears and all the philanthro philanthropy that has happened on campus and will continue to happen on our campus. Um, and so with that, we're going, we're coming to the very end of our tour. Um, if you need, if you want to contact us, if you can always um, uh, email us at tour.berkeley.edu or follow us on social media at visit UC Berkeley um, on, I believe it's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, maybe not Facebook, but Instagram, Twitter, and, um, YouTube, that's the other one. Um, and speaking of YouTube, you can go and see our other virtual campus visits as well as student panels and most likely this tour on our YouTube at Visit UC Berkeley. Um, and also go to more to find out more about tours, specifically go to visit.berkeley.edu. And there's plenty of other homecoming things um, uh, happening, whether it's tours or panels or lectures. So you can always go and check them out at homecoming.berkeley.edu. Or if you download the guidebook app, you can go to the guidebook app and see all the events that are coming up in the next weekend. So, um, and also leave, finally leading, leaving off with the 150 years of women. Again, this is the 150th anniversary of women. So you can go check out all the news events have, um, uh, around that at 150w.berkeley.edu. And you can read some campus ambassador stories um, and just a, a kind of blog at Bear Talk Blogs. Um, uh, if you go to that website there, you can go check out the campus life and what it's like being an ambassador and students, especially in these uncertain times. Um, so with that, we're going to leave you off with a Go Bears. So Danielle, on the count of three, one, two, three, Go Bears! Go Bears! Cool. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and have a great rest of your homecoming weekends.